What did the Romans ever do for English? You know, apart from give us our calendar, our alphabet, tens of thousands of words, etc. English has been influenced by Latin since, well, Roman times, since before English was even English. It hasn't just given us fancy scientific words, it's given us words we use every single day, maybe without even realising it. In this video, let's look at how Latin has shaped English down the ages, for better and for worse. Welcome to another Rob Words. It's true, the influence of the Romans on English goes back to before English even existed. Old English is the language spoken by the Germanic peoples living in England from the 5th century onwards, the Anglo-Saxons. But they didn't just land in the British Isles and decide to invent a language. Old English formed from the languages that these Germanic tribes brought with them from back home. And it was back on the continent that the Roman influence on what would become English began. Those Romans got blooming everywhere. And through the interactions between the Romans and these northern tribes, we see Latin words entering into the Germanic languages, many of which remain in those languages today. They reflect the sorts of encounters that were taking place. The Germani and the Romans didn't always get on, so that's why a lot of Latin words associated with fortification start entering the Germanic vocabulary. It's why we have the words camp, the words wall, and the word pit. The Roman generals also marched their armies for miles, another Latin import word from the time, along their famous Roman roads. All roads lead to Rome because the Romans built them. So the Germanic languages import the Latin word strata, which becomes our word street, and also the German word for street, and the Dutch word for street. The Old English epic poem Beowulf features this sentence here. Straight was Stanfa. Excuse my terrible Old English pronunciation. The street was paved with stones. The Germanic peoples also borrow words associated with Roman high society, which remain with us now. This is when we get the words wine and cheese, pepper and butter. In fact, the flour, the butter cup, is made up of two words we get from Latin at this time. So already we've busted any misconception that Old English was a language free of borrowed words when it sprung into existence on the British Isles. And it's once the Anglo-Saxons arrived there from the European mainland that the second big influx of Roman vocab happens. The Germanic tribes arrive in a Britain, or Britannia, that has been fairly recently vacated by the Romans. Apparently they didn't like the weather or something. After embracing Christianity themselves, the Romans then set about converting the Celts living in the British Isles to the religion too. And in doing so, they gave them a shed load of religious Latin words. So when the pagan Angles and Saxons and that lot arrive in England, they're subject to a double team attempt to convert them to Christianity too, with the holy pincer movement of missionaries from Ireland and from Rome. It is no surprise that the Anglo-Saxon language, Old English, started to take in these Latin religious words as well. It's in this period that we get the words altar, angel, candle, cross, shrine, temple, and a whole churchload of others. The Christian missionaries are also responsible for a change the likes of which we haven't seen since. They change the alphabet. Old English goes from being written using the runic fudork, named for the sounds of the first six letters, to the Latin alphabet. Latin was the dominant language of written texts because basically the only literate people were monks. It was the language of scholarship as well, so this is also the period when scholarly words like school, master and pupil enter English as well. It's already during the Old English period that we see the Roman names for the months appearing as well, the names that we still use. The monk, the Venerable Bede, the source for so much of our knowledge of Old English, lists these names alongside the Anglo-Saxon pre-Christian names for the months, but the Roman months eventually, of course, displace those altogether. Only the ones that managed to find a new place within Christianity managed to survive. Easter and Yule. So we've covered a couple of ways in which Latin words entered Old English, but one massive influx of Latinate words ends up being enough to bring about the end of Old English altogether. 
It's all down to the French. We'll get onto that in a second. But first, if learning French is on your to-do list or any other languages, you should check out LingoPi, who've helped me bring you this video. LingoPi is the world's first language learning platform that uses foreign TV shows and movies to teach new languages. I've talked before about how watching foreign stuff helped me learn German and French, and LingoPi could not make doing that any simpler. Just pick your target language and scroll your way through their huge selection of fully licensed content from places like Netflix. Then sit down and binge watch yourself towards fluency. The interactive subtitles mean you can get an instant translation of any words you don't know, and you can change the playback speed, see a transcription of the video, and at the end, LingoPi will run you through some flashcards and quiz you on the words that you needed help with. So go to learn.lingopi.com slash robwords, or click the link in the description below to get 55% off the annual plan, and let the sofa-sitting language learning begin. Now, it's 1066. William the Conqueror and his invading hordes have brought with them a vast vocabulary of words that will infiltrate Old English to the point of transforming it into Middle English. William the Conqueror's lot were speaking a variety of Old French called Norman French, a language that, like modern French, was a direct descendant of the Latin spoken in Rome. Now, I could go down the road of talking about all the French words that entered English at this time, but boy, would that take an age. But needless to say, filling up the upper echelons of English society with French speakers resulted in English acquiring all kinds of Latin-derived words, including, as well as relating to, justice, art, administration, and nobility. The Norman invasion is a way in which English took on board a transformationally large quantity of Latin words indirectly. So let's move on to a period where we start to once again extract Roman vocab direct from source. Time for the Renaissance. Or the Renaissance, whatever. Now we've left Middle English behind, and we're on to the Early Modern English period, a period sometimes known as the Age of Linguistic Anxiety. English is being much more broadly accepted as a legit language for academia at this point. But the problem is, the English vocabulary isn't always up to the job. There's an urgent need for new English words for various concepts in fields like science and philosophy, and to fill in those gaps, scientists and scholars looked to classical Latin and Greek, the languages into which a lot of science from places like Arabia had already been translated. And they didn't just borrow a few words, words like atmosphere, extinguish, system, climax. They borrowed lots of them. So much so that dictionaries had to be invented to explain what these new words meant. They also started using little show-off Latin phrases like inter alia, ad hoc, in situ, vice versa, etc. Except not etc. That was a much earlier import during the Middle English period, because it was really handy for things like lists and counting and so on. Why didn't they just use and so on? There was even a backlash, the famous inkhorn controversy, where some scholars were accused of importing too many Latin and Greek terms. As a result, writers like Sir John Cheek shunned them all together, arguably going a bit too far the other way, actually. His translation of the Gospel according to Matthew from the Bible includes words like hundreder instead of centurion, and crossed instead of crucified, none of which really caught on. This is also the point when Latin-obsessed scholars start to make a mess of English spelling, too. Words that have until now had perfectly reasonable spellings have silent letters imposed upon them by academics wanting to show off that they're aware of their Latin roots, ignoring the fact that English took them from Old French, not from Latin. It's through this process that plumber gets its silent B, and receipt gets its silent P. Also, adventure gets that D, and perfect gets the C, but we've actually ended up pronouncing those ones. Anyway, these unwanted, extraneous letters aren't the only legacy of this time, thankfully. Latin and Greek become well-established as the best sources from which to coin new words in the English language. And that's a practice that has continued right up until today. 
In the centuries since the Renaissance, throughout the scientific and industrial revolutions and developments in medical science, we've looked to Latin for names for new inventions and concepts. Using classical Latin and ancient Greek, two dead languages, has the advantage of being, I suppose, linguistically neutral. It means French speakers, German speakers, and English speakers, for example, can all use the same words if they want to. So let's take a look at medicine. When a new disease has come along, we've pulled out some Latin to help us name it, or given some ancient Greek a sort of Latin twist. Anemia is a good example. It means lack of blood. We've also given Latin names to parts of the body. We don't talk about our heart and vein network. We talk about our cardiovascular system. Cardio being Latin for heart and vascular from Latin for vein. And of course, the word system itself is of Latin origin. Nowadays, studying medicine can be quite the cerebral exercise involving the mastering of a huge mass of Greek and Latin jargon. I do not envy those doctors at all. We've assigned Latin names to animals too, and when we find a new one, we make up some Latin for that as well. And need I mention the terrible lizards? More on that coming soon as well. Just click subscribe. And away from the natural world, as new inventions helped us move forward, we've looked backward to name them. We've had the steam locomotive, the thing that helped us move from one place to another. We also had the automobile, the self-driver. Calculator is a Latin word repurposed for a new era, as is the word digital. Television is a weird one because it's a mix of Greek and Latin, but in this modern age of the computer, a word ultimately with Latin roots itself, we continue to reach for Latin in its own right, to dig us out of a verbal hole, or even to add a little futuristic prestige. Remember Oculus? And on your computer, monitor. Classical Latin is not even a click away. Cursor is a Latin word too. So might I encourage you to use your cursor or indeed your digits to click the like and subscribe buttons. And also, you know, check out this video here, which is all about what English would be like if we didn't have all of this French, Latin, and Greek. Oh, and by the way, I've got a newsletter now. Go to robwords.com slash newsletter to sign up for word, fun, and language facts straight to your inbox once a week. Cheers.